Okay, students and guests, welcome. Um, we have two very special guests with us tonight that Alex is going to introduce in just a minute. But just to remind you, we have only two more lectures after tonight. Next week, it is Sawyer Hemsley, the founder of Crumble Cookies. He will be here on April 5th. And then our very final night is April 12th. It's our Shark Tank night, and it's going to be really awesome. We have six students pitching to our judges and investors, and then we have some real fun entertainment that night. It's, it's just kind of a final event for this class. Um, if you're going to be here next year, we're already booking speakers for next year. We have a great lineup again next year, and I'll be able to share some of those names with you maybe in the next week or so. But uh, I'm just thrilled that Paul and Heather are here. Uh, they're awesome people, good friends, and I'm going to let Alex introduce them right now, and then we'll let them take over. Okay, so Paul is an accomplished senior senior executive and entrep entrepreneur with a 30 year track record of promotion through progressively greater roles of responsibility for global communication and technology companies. Currently, he is the director of global wor workforce development for Amazon Web Services Infrastructure. Prior to Amazon, Paul worked at Accenture as the managing director of strategy consulting. Paul, Paul earned a master's di diploma in strategy and innovation from Oxford University and an MBA from DePaul University. Paul is an avid adventurer and has completed ma major marathons on all seven continents. During the two and a half years of COVID, he and Heather were able to work remotely from their boat while cruising from Florida to Seattle via the Panama Canal. And Heather is an international business leader with 20 plus years of experience leading strategy growth, global expansions, and, man, um, and management consulting services. She has designed and implemented new solutions in business transformation efforts for many of the most prominent companies around the world. She has worked in 14 countries for firms including Ernst & Young, Deloitte Consulting, Nordal Networks, and the Mills Corporation. Currently, Heather is the client relations executive at Price Waterhouse Price Waterhouse Coopers for one of their largest high-tech clients, leading all aspects of global business development across their portfolio companies. Heather holds a business degree from the University of Washington and is a founding member of the C Certificate of International Studies in Business Program. So um, welcome Heather and Paul. Andy, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, and I'm Paul, this is Heather, and uh, we're honored to be here uh, tonight speaking at uh, USU's uh, Center for Entrepreneurship. So thank you very much. Uh, over the past several weeks, I think you've had eight different founders or co-founders who've, uh, who've been here presenting about their entrepreneurial careers, the challenges, ups, downs uh, of their individual ventures. Heather and I are a little bit different. Uh, so while we've both worked in several different multinational companies, uh, many consulting firms internationally and domestically, uh, what we want to spend most of our time on tonight is how we've been entrepreneurial with our time. So as Andy said, uh, as part of the introduction, and uh, we've been working remotely for the last three years. Uh, so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how we have been intentionally innovative and adventurous with the use of our time as we've gone from Florida to the Bahamas, all the way to Panama, through the Panama Canal, up the coast of uh, Central America to Mexico, and then all the way up the west coast of the US to the very top of uh, Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, and then back down to Seattle, uh, where we live and work today. So before we get in to uh, dive into this project of working remotely, I'll hand it over to Heather to uh, introduce a little bit about herself. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> My name is Heather Brewer, and I live and am from Seattle. I grew up in Seattle, went to the University of Washington, and then uh, in the course of my career, I've lived 12 years in Spain, two years in London, uh, about three years in Central and South America, and also New York City and Washington, D.C. 
my international passion really started when I was five years old, seriously. <laughs> so my dad wanted to really teach me the power of saving and the importance of saving. And so when I was five years old, and I'm the oldest of six, he said, Heather, any money that you put in the bank, I will match. So if I got $5 for mowing the lawn, he would put another five, and I would have 10. But the stipulation was I could only use it for travel. This was pretty like entrepreneurial back in the 70s. I'm going to date myself. <laughs> and by the time I was 13 years old, I'd saved $660, and I bought my own ticket to Italy to live abroad for two months. I lived with a family that my dad had stayed with when he was in college, and it opened my eyes to the world. When I came back in eighth grade, I had to pick a language, and things have changed today, but uh, we had to pick between French, German, and Spanish. So I picked Spanish because it was closest to Italian. <laughs> and over the course of my life, um, by the way, the, the travel fund ended in high school. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I ended up uh, working and living overseas and really uh, always wanting to take the risk to do something different. So my uh, college career and my actual career have been nothing linear, OK? I've gone up, down, all around. Uh, but one thing is clear is that I've always taken the risk to do something different. So at the University of Washington, I was in the business school, the Foster Business School, and I was an accounting major. And the accounting major was super rigid. And they said I could not study abroad. Well, that wasn't going to work for me. <laughs> so I went overseas to Spain anyway and studied a semester at, in Spain and stayed another six months working in the summer. When I came back, I co-founded the international business program called the Certificate of International Studies and Business Program at the University of Washington. That program is still going 25 years later with tens of thousands of uh, alumni and every year about 500 students. The same thing happened. <laughs> Um, the same thing happened with Ernst & Young. I wanted to go with a global company where no matter where I went in the world, the brand would be recognized. So I went with Ernst & Young, and I started in their uh, Washington, D.C. office. It was closer to Europe. <laughs> and uh, after four years, I was about to be able to go overseas with work, and they said no. The firms were, were buckling down. It was a bad economy. And so what did I do? I took a plane and went back to Spain, and I went to Sevilla, where I was an exchange student. I borrowed a suit from my host mom, and I went down the street, literally, and knocked on the door of Ernst & Young and said, you know, hey, I'm Heather. I work in Washington, D.C. Can I, you know, come see your office? They thought I was crazy. They gave me an office tour, and in one of the corners, I saw this, it, it, my view back then was this old man and director general, which was general director. And he was hovered over his papers. And I just walked in there, and I said, hey, I'm Heather. I want to work in Spain. <laughs> and he thought I was crazy. But I think because of that, we had a great conversation. And three months later, when I was working hard at EY in Washington, D.C., the same partner called me back and offered me a job in Spain. However, I was going to be a local hire, which meant no expat benefits. They were not going to pay for my move. And at the time, it was pre-Euro, so I was going to get paid 4 million pesetas, which was $14,000 a year, which was about an 80% pay cut. <laughs> All of the partners that I worked with thought I was crazy. My friends thought I was crazy. Uh, but I, it's not just about the money. It was about the experience. And I wanted to get experience working overseas, speaking Spanish, seeing the world. That was my passion. Well, I ended up spending eight years in Spain got into doing mergers and acquisitions, which I did for the next 15 years in Spanish-speaking countries. And when I went back to the States in, well, anyway, about eight years later, the same partners that said I was crazy were trying to get me to come back. And guess what? My salary skyrocketed because now I spoke Spanish and some Portuguese. They hired me to lead transactions in Central and South America. So it worked out. It was great. I became what some people say is the Spain girl. I'm an expert at launching US businesses in Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, recently, in 2015, I led the launch of Costco Spain. And right now, I work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, and I lead the relationship with Amazon. So what do I do in my free time? Well, I love the outdoors. I'm loving Utah. 
In fact, a couple years ago, I did the Ragnar in uh, Zion, which was really fun. I love backpacking, hiking. I'm also part of the only all-women ski team in Seattle for the City League, so that's really fun. Um, over here, in Spanish, they say sobremesa, like we're going to make a sobremesa. And that literally means over the table. But what it means and represents is a table, you know, a communal table with friends, family, sharing a meal, laughing, talking. That is my passion. And then finally, for volunteering, uh, I work for or volunteer for an organization called REST, which stands for Real Escape from the Sex Trade. And I help victims of self trap self sex trafficking, kind of get back on their feet and into society and into the communities in a healthy way. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Paul. Great. Thanks, Heather. So again, Paul Boltzma, and I also live in Seattle now. I moved there six years ago when I took the job for Amazon Web Services, Amazon's cloud computing business. But I'm originally from uh, Michigan, and I grew up there. Uh, I'm the last of nine kids. My dad was... Uh, excuse me, a big adventurer, and I, I really learned about adventure from him, and so he, he quit high school because he wanted to be a deep sea diver, and so he joined the Navy, and then he ended up spending all of World War II in the Pacific on a submarine. A couple of years later, he moved back to Michigan and opened uh, the first marine construction company in the Great Lakes, so he was an entrepreneur by very nature. A couple of years after that, he ended up buying the USS Tautog, the most successful submarine in World War II, decommissioned it, towed it back to the Great Lakes, and my siblings, before I was born, used to play hide-and-go-seek in the submarine in Michigan. Um, pretty cool, and I'm still a little bit pissed that I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, anyway, when I was eight years old, my parents pulled me out of school, and with three of my siblings, we sailed from Michigan through the Great Lakes, down the Erie Barge Canal, which are 38 locks to New York, down the East Coast to the Bahamas, and one of my sisters tutored me. But that really started my adventure uh, love, and especially the love of water. So uh, I have three children, two boys that are finished college, and a daughter that's in college in Colorado right now, and have a dog, a Hungarian Vishla dog named Mira, who will feature prominently in our presentation today. Uh, and when we got back to Seattle last year, we got another uh, Hungarian Vishla puppy named Hala, and that uh, means gratitude in Hungarian, and uh, you'll hear about gratitude kind of throughout the presentation. Um, so I went to Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, and uh, double majored in business and international economics in undergrad. Afterwards, I went to work for Motorola, who was kind of a preeminent employer in Chicago at the time, and I went and got my MBA in international finance uh, well, at night while I was working at Motorola. After that, I wanted to apply those skills um, in international finance to consulting. And so I ended up uh, joining Coopers and Librand's International Telecom Consulting Group and did that for a couple of years. And then I was recruited to join this brand new telecom startup called Level 3 Communications, which was the best funded telecom startup at the time. And I joined as number 70 uh, in their first international hire, went to Chicago, put together the international business plan, moved to Belgium, opened up a bunch of offices in Europe, moved to London and uh, headed up business development for a while before moving back to Boulder, Colorado with them. And I ultimately left there in 2006 and started my own little consulting company and did that for about 18 months before getting recruited with Accenture I went back to London to head up their strategy practice for communications, media, and high-tech companies uh, uh, for uh, some time there. I was in London for five years. Uh, while I was there, I asked if I could go back to school, and Accenture said yes, and paid for me to go back to Oxford and get my master's in strategy and innovation, which was a fantastic program at the time. Uh, I left Accenture in 2017 and joined uh, AWS in Seattle, uh, and that's where I am today. I'm the Director of Workforce Development, and we do early stage recruiting. Um, last year, we hired about 50, 1,500 people. 52% of that was diverse. And um, then we have training, technical documentation, and localization within the team that I run, and we support an organization of about 15,000 people. So out of these six companies, 
This represents about 24 moves for me physically during my career, and about six of those were international. Um, and we talked about work-life harmony a little bit in the beginning, or I forgot to mention that, but it is important. It's a big topic today within the industry, and I haven't always done very well in that and been very balanced in that in my career. But back in, in 2012, I quit smoking and uh, drinking alcohol, and I started running 24 years after I had finished playing soccer at Wheaton and, uh, and started running. And uh, in 2018, finished a marathon in Antarctica, which was the last of the seven continents. And that's where I met uh, Mike Losser and his speedy wife, Mary, running the, uh, the marathon on the Inca Trail in Peru uh, back in 2017, right? Um, last October, uh, I finished the London Marathon, and that was the, the final of the six Abbott World Marathon majors, which include Berlin, Tokyo, New York, Chicago, and Boston. And actually in May, Heather and I are gonna to go to Bhutan to run a marathon up in the Himalayas, which she's really excited about. Um, last year I was able to join the Traveler's Century Club, which um, is a unique experience having visited 104 countries. So there's actually a, a club for people that have visited more than 100 countries. And then a, a good way to celebrate time is by giving back as well. So I work on a national advisory board for uh, Back on My Feet, which teaches um, discipline to homeless folks who are trying to get back into the workforce. And running becomes a method of discipline uh, for them to get back into the workforce. And then within AWS, we have a program called In Communities. And for all of the people in our organization, this is a volunteerism way to give back to local communities. Last year, we had about 15,000 hours of volunteerism. This is uh, something I was able to participate in right before COVID happening, happened, opening a Think Big space at a school in Mumbai, India, that exposes young people and girls especially to careers in technology. So that's a little bit about the entrepreneurial use of time. Uh, <clears throat> so I was fortunate enough to be here in this same forum back in February of 2019. And I was, as I was putting the presentation together for tonight, I went back to that February 2019 presentation and said, you know, do these same points still ring true? You know, this was pre-COVID, have things changed? And as we read through these, Heather and I both agreed that these things still do underline a lot of the principles of success that we've been able to face both in our careers as well as personally. So we'll go through some of these over the course of the presentation, but I'll hand it back to Heather to talk about how we've experienced some of these things together. All right, well this is a class and a forum for entrepreneurs. So we looked up the definition of what is an entrepreneur. And the defi definition that we found is a person who creates a new business with all the possible risks, they bring a new idea whoo, uh, to the table for a new business, and then they acquire the resources, labor, and capital to set up the business. I'm not sure uh, if, you know, the leaders here would agree. Okay. So we use this, but instead of starting a business, we use this as an opportunity for an op being an entrepreneur of our time and experience. So as we kind of think about this presentation, we really went through all of these steps. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> so how did Paul and I meet? And, and we are together. Um, Paul and I met actually online on a dating site, Bumble, in 2020. And I was from, I'm from Seattle, and I had never met someone in Seattle that had been in 94 countries. I had just gotten back to Seattle, and I was really missing my international kind of world. And I was so excited to meet him. Well, two days before our date, he disappeared. And I was asking my friends, like, what happened? And they're like, oh, he totally unmatched you. <laughs> Like, why would he do that? <laughs> to this day, he said he didn't do that. But I was, I've never done this, but I stalked him. And all I knew was his name was Paul, and he went to Oxford. And I didn't even know if he worked. So I just took a guess and put Amazon, and boom, on LinkedIn, his name popped up. And no joke, this is the message that I sent him. Hey, Paul, I wanted to write you back, and you disappeared. This is Heather from Bumble. 
I was really looking forward to meeting you. Um, if you unmatched me, totally fine, but I don't know why you would. <laughs> and so he wrote me back, and our first date was March 2nd, 2020. So we went on one dinner date, and then the following week on uh, March 9th, we went on another dinner date. And then everyone in Seattle, there was a mandate to work from home. No one knew, and I'm sure you all were a part of it, you know, no one knew what COVID was or what the pandemic was or really what it meant. It was just go home and quarantine. So Paul starts thinking, hey, you know, he, he sends me a text message and he says, hey, Heather, um, we all have to work remote, so I'm going to go work from Central America and, and check off some countries. Because if you haven't noticed, he likes to check the box, right, on everything. So he's like, do you want to come with me? This is via text. We'd spent six hours together. And I was like, sure. <laughs> and I don't know if you've seen Tinder Swindler on the, on the movies, but uh, I Venmoed him uh, $1,500, and we met for our third date at the uh, United Airlines in SeaTac and with a one-way ticket to Guatemala. And uh, no, I did not tell my parents. <laughs> so anyway, our third date, we went to Guatemala. Uh, we got there. When we woke up, the Guatemala borders uh, shut down. So we took a taxi to El Salvador, but that had already shut down. So we flew to Nicaragua. We did our uh, little sand surfing here, which was more like <laughs> a slide. Um, and that's us on the border of uh, El Salvador. Uh, it was completely empty. And long story short, we ended up going to Nicaragua, Panama. We ended up in Cartagena, Colombia. And that was my dream. We got there at midnight. When we woke up, there was an armed guard in front of our door. And he said, we cannot let you go out only to the airport to go back to the States. So in five days, we saw seven countries, and we got along great, and it was just a great experience. So once we got back, Paul had this little boat. I thought it was a huge boat, um, but Paul had this boat 31 feet. And in April, we decided, why don't we just take this out for a weekend, right? Let's bring a little hot spot. Let's see if we can work from the boat. And we brought Mira the dog, and we worked for the, we went there for the week, and we're like, this is really cool. Well, next thing you know, we were out on this boat for five months. Um, there was only one plug. There was no shower, only 25 gallons of water, which we prioritized coffee. And we had the time of our lives. Paul um, worked down on this teeny tiny table that was probably two by two. He couldn't even fit underneath it. And then I put up uh, tapestries so that I could create a room for me to work. So this was amazing, and that's how we spent most of 2020. Paul, next slide. So, um, <laughs> so the whole summer, Paul, you know, we hadn't been on boats before, right? And we, we're not trust fund kids. We don't, we're not independently wealthy. We don't, we're not technical. You know, we really didn't ha know how to do anything, and really everything went wrong on this trip. But Paul started really looking at different boats. We didn't know about really boats. We didn't know the difference between a trawler boat and a yacht or any of that. But every night he'd be looking and day incessantly at boats. So basically one night, um, I think it was December 5th, 2020, we're eating dinner and he's like, Heather, look at this boat. It's perfect. And I said, you know what? I'm so tired of this. If this is the perfect boat, then get the boat right? And so two hours later, um, we were literally brushing our teeth, and we bought the boat. Sight unseen, it was in Florida. We don't know how to use the boat. We don't know how to get to the boat or how to get the boat back to Seattle, um, but we signed for a boat, and we had the beginning of a crew, which was us. Is it? You know, okay. So we were in a hurry. I, I, at this point, I needed to be back at work in Seattle in July. So we had seven months to do this entire trip and plan and execute. And so it was go time. So uh, we provisioned the entire boat from Seattle, ordering everything off of Amazon, shipping it to a hotel in Florida. Two weeks later, they had two pallets worth of boxes, and they were so excited to see us leave. Um, but we flew from Seattle to Florida, Christmas Day 2020. On uh, December uh, 26, it was our first night that we stayed on the boat, and that's the first 
time we've actually uh, started this Instagram account called Working Remotely, which if you haven't taken a look at it, please take a look at it, follow it, and it, co it covers this entire trip. Uh, working remotely, one word. Um, but we ended up spending uh, the next six weeks provisioning the boat. Luckily, uh, the survey turned out well and there wasn't any major issues, but the electronics were 15 years old, so we were gonna upgrade all of the electronics. We needed to work full time up from the boat while we were traveling, so we had to install a satellite system, and, uh, and we didn't know how to operate the boat. So I hired a captain, figured out how to hire a captain, I hired a program manager to help program manage this, and we worked to let go of ego. Like, I would have loved to have said, I captained the boat this entire way, but there was no physical way that we would have gained all the experience, learned how to navigate the boat, uh, learned about the boat, learned all the mechanics, so it's a much more sophisticated boat. So letting go of ego and identifying that and letting that go is a big part of getting ready for the journey. Um, so when we were in Florida, we had to think out of the box about provisioning the boat. So some things are pretty straightforward. Other things, like the boat had no dining room table. That's kind of important when you're going to be gone for several months with a couple of people on the boat. So I bought a teak table off of Amazon, shipped it to the boat, but it turned out to be 10 inches too long. So I had a, uh, a contractor cut the table in half, and we took out 10 inches and then glued it back together. And that worked fantastic until the first shakeout cruise when we were out and Mira, the dog, was sleeping in the galley, and we got into some really heavy waves, and the table fell over and almost killed the dog. So we figured out a way to screw the table into the floor, and that lasted throughout the entire trip and worked really, really well. Uh, we had no idea how to fish. Neither one of us are fisher people. And so Heather, a few days before we left, hired a captain of a fishing boat to take her to a store and in two hours bought all of our fishing gear. And we figured we'd learn how to fish later, which we did. Um, and so on, was it February 25th, 2001, we said goodbye to all of the gentlemen that helped us in Fort Lauderdale and we left uh, Florida for the Bahamas. So we ended up being in the Bahamas for two months. And we couldn't believe, we were absolutely giddy that we could actually work while being in these glorious bays and learning about the boat and kayaking and swimming, even with a lot of sharks. Um, when we left, the number one question that we got from all of our friends and family was, what are you going to do about safety? Because there are still pirates on the west side of the uh, Caribbean. Um, are you going to take a gun? And the answer is no, we didn't take a gun. And we're not naive, uh, but we planned for safety and, uh, and things worked out okay. Uh, what we did take was a lot of medical kits and we were well prepared in terms of medicine and that came in very handy. In the Bahamas, I almost uh, cut my finger off flying the drone for the first time, as you can see from the uh, hospital bed. Um, and in the Bahamas, in uh, one day, I managed to be bitten by a barracuda and a dog in one day, which is not a very good uh, process either. Um, and so uh, this was a, uh, a fantastic experience, and we were, we were absolutely giddy that things were working out as well as they were. Now, communications was very important, and we knew uh, our basic requirements were that we needed to have two simultaneous Zoom calls going anywhere in the world while we were traveling. Uh, so we started out with phones and using plans per country. Well, that's getting we fixed. Go. I can still talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Entrepreneurial. Uh, so, uh, communications uh, ubiquitously while we were going. We started out with phones with domestic plans per country. Once we got offshore, uh, it switched over to a cellular system that I had built into the boat. And once we were 10 to 15 miles offshore, then it switched over to a satellite system uh, that we had built in uh, to the boat and everything was connected through a Wi-Fi network. It worked great and we were able to have two simultaneous video calls and work even while going from the Bahamas all the way to Panama. Uh, a thousand miles. But communications were super expensive. And so in the end, we ended up spending 
literally five times as much on communications as we spent on fuel. And I got back to Seattle and I was talking to an economist friend about this and he said, Paul, he said, you just paid the pioneer tax because we're not retired, we're not independently wealthy, but it was a tax that we needed to pay to be able to go and work full time. And so it was table stakes. You either go and pay or you don't do it. And we all uh, elected that that was a money well worth spending. Now that we're back in Seattle, uh, uh, I have just installed Elon Musk's Starlink system, which is incredible technology. And I've turned the old satellite system off. The hardware for Starlink is 4% of the cost of the old satellite system. The monthly bills are 2% of the cost of the old system. And the bandwidth is 20x compared to the old system. And so it's an amazing technology. So for all of you who are going to be working and hopefully more remote than us old people, this is awesome technology for you guys. And Amazon's launching our low Earth satellite system next year called Project Kuiper, which is going to drive the cost down even further. So this is really exciting area that's going to be a major impact to uh, your <coughs> lifetime. Okay, so uh, this is a bit about our journey uh, in the boat all the way back to Seattle. So we left the Bahamas, I think, around April 12th, 2021, and we were going to do a straight shot to Panama. So it's over 1,000 miles, uh, a full week, 24-7. And because we were working and because people need to sleep and do shifts, Paul had one of his high school friends who is also a captain for sailboats join us, and he and our captain um, did the boat for us while we worked, and we all took turns getting down to uh, Panama. What we were worried about, and again, this is kind of entrepreneurial, we hadn't really thought about the dog. So our captain was, the first captain, he was really nervous about bringing our dog, almost said he wouldn't go if the dog went, because you have to make sure that the dog can um, drink water, eat, and do their business, and if the dog gets seasick, it could be really bad for the dog. Well, Paul's niece is actually the veterinarian for the Alaska Iditarod. And he called her and she said, here's the trick. You take wet dog food, put it in ice trays, freeze it, and then your dog thinks it's a toy and they get water and food. Brilliant. It worked like a charm. So after one week, it was like 2 a.m., and we see the lights of Panama. And I felt like the old explorers. I was like, land, ho! And literally, like, it, it was such an amazing feeling to think that we crossed that entire, um, you know, body of water to Panama. So when we get to Panama, they kind of, it, it's one thing that you really have to plan for. We really went day by day. But to go through the Panama Canal actually is quite a long process of planning. Um, you basically get staged at this marina on the east side of Panama um, and in the Puerto Colon. And you have to stay there and at any given moment. Once they say you can go through, you have four hours or more or less to get to the first lock. Well, you could be there for 10 days. Some people had been there for 400 days. Like it's, it was crazy and it was a global pandemic. So we hired a uh, local captain, and after about four days, they called us that it was our turn to go to the locks. It was 7 o'clock at night, and we went through our first lock. Now, I'm kind of ruining the question, but out of curiosity, don't be afraid to raise your hand. How many locks are there in the Panama Canal? One? Three? Six? Okay. Okay. Well, we didn't know either, and there are three locks, and who knew that there was a 28-mile lake in the middle, freshwater, man-made lake. So we anchored in that lake the day after we went through the first lock, and then, next slide. Uh, this was us coming out the next day onto the Pacific side of Panama. So it was a bucket list item. It was truly amazing. <clears throat> now, with any business, you always have to continually assess your personnel and also how your business grows. Your needs when you first start might be different a year from now or 10 years from now, right? So it's really important that you're always going back to that business plan. What, are your, what do you need? 
Well, for us, our first captain got us there safely, but we did not jive with him at all. We weren't learning. He wasn't, his example of just delivering the boat wasn't aligned to us about having, you know, fun and experiencing the boat. So we switched out captains to this, uh, to Jean-Claude Schubel, and he is a captain for sailboats. He had never been on a motorboat before. Uh, but we switched out the captains, and JC, he is like our family. He was with us for a year and a half, and he brought, I mean, the minute he got on the boat, we started putting out lines. We started catching mahi-mahi. Uh, I was named the CFO, Chief Fun Officer. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we just had a ball, and this opened up a whole new experience for us. So as soon as uh, JC was aboard, uh, we left Panama City, and we went out to La Perla Islands, which is an archipelago of about 200 islands off the west coast of Panama. And over the next couple of weeks, we kept on going further and further west, and finally we were in the furthest west island, um, there's nobody else around. The next stop were the Galapagos off of Ecuador. And uh, we went to anchor in this beautiful, absolutely gorgeous, pristine bay. But before the anchor actually hit the floor of the seabed, around the corner comes this boat flying towards us. <clears throat> and as we get closer, uh, there's eight guys all wearing black with balaclavas all carrying submachine guns. JC went pale, I freaked out, and Heather comes bopping up to the deck and is like, don't worry, I've got this. And, and uh, within minutes, she had them laughing and smiling, and I think she offered them all coffee or an espresso uh, and made them very happy. But we learned not to anchor in military bays pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> we then continued up north. Uh, we were kind of midway up... Uh, Panama, and we went to this place called Cohiba Island, which is a huge uh, nature preserve. Heather got certified for scuba diving, and it really helped uh, us be able to experience much more of all of the places we were going because we were able to experience both above the water and below the water, and so it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and uh, as we went further north um, in Panama, uh, things just kept getting better in terms of uh, more and more fishing and more and more wildlife. The thing that surprised us about the Pacific is the amount of wildlife versus the Atlantic, 10 to 20 times the amount. Like every single day we saw dolphins, we saw mobula rays that are like six foot rays that just pop up out of the water like champagne corks all over the place. Uh, green turtles, whales were regular, and we caught mahi-mahi, at least one if not two every day and had like fresh ceviche every day. It was fantastic. Now, everybody knows that en uh, entrepreneurs create really, really rigorous business plans, right? Uh, so we did too. Uh, these are three examples. So the far left is our planning efforts in the San Juan Islands in Washington in 2020. The middle is heading up the coast of uh, Costa Rica in 2021. And the far right is us heading up the coast of the United States in 2022. Our planning efforts didn't change a lot or get more rigorous over the course of those three years. But flexibility is key for us and for any entrepreneurs out there. And for us, flexibility was safety as well because we needed to work around weather windows as part of that safety. Within Costa Rica, we started in the far, far south in this beautiful little cartel town called Golfito. And uh, Heather was able to celebrate her birthday in some eco lodge up in the rainforest there. I celebrated my birthday in uh, Manuel Antonio, which Andy and I were talking about earlier. And that's where we caught our first marlin. And then we continued north, uh, about halfway up Costa Rica. There's a huge bay uh, in and around Punta Arenas is the town, and that's where we stopped swimming off the boat after we stopped, uh, after we would anchor, as the alligators were starting to swim around the boat. There's, we learned that there's such a thing as saltwater alligators that actually come out of the rivers. Um, so we stopped swimming. Uh, we went all the way up to Papagayo Peninsula, which is in the far north, where we left Costa Rica, and that's where I finally got over an ear infection that actually started all the way back in Panama with scuba diving and lasted through two countries, five doctors, 
12 prescriptions and something I'm still very skeptical about where Heather translated from a doctor that I needed to get a shot in the butt and she needed to administer it as her first shot ever because I think it's a very long way away from the ear. But, um, <laughs> but it, it solved the problem ultimately. Uh, and then we had to go from Costa Rica all the way to Chiapas, Mexico. So we bypassed Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And so it was going to be a 60-hour, three-day trip going 24 by 7. So we were preparing for this for a while um, because we were all taking three-hour shifts, 24 hours a day. Um, and as we, we uh, headed up here, we were um, heading from Costa Rica to Chiapas, and we were off about 50 miles off the coast of Nicaragua. And this was June 18th of 2021 and turned out to be the best day ever. So from 8 to 5 that day, all day long, there was this enormous pod of spinner dolphins that were following us. They say there's 600,000 spinner dolphins in the world, and I think there were about 300,000 following us that day. And Heather finally gets me off of a video call at 5.30, I was diligently working, and Heather comes down and is like, Paul, you've got to come and see this. And so I went, I dropped the call and went up to the deck. And as far as you could see, there's no other boats. You can't see land. But as far as you can see, 360 degrees, the water is just frothing with dolphins. It's just insane, the amount of dolphins that are there. And so we did the unthinkable, and we stopped the boat. And in 6,000 feet of water, um, we abandoned ship, and we went swimming. And so we just put on uh, goggles and snorkels and fins, and we jumped in. And, and there were like one or two dolphins. There were like tens of dolphins going all around us, and the noise was like deafening, and it was incredible. And so we got back on the boat eventually. JC was more adventurous than us. He jumped in, and he swam along the right-hand side of the boat, and Heather and I are watching him. And all of a sudden, just off his right-hand shoulder, a blue whale surfaces. And you can't even imagine to put this on a bucket list, right? It was just the best day ever. <laughs> oh, it's my turn. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to quickly summarize the, the West Coast adventure up to Seattle. So just to put it in retrospect, this will be about a year on the boat and a few slides. So... Um, we got to Chiapas, Mexico, talking to the militares. They can come on board. They, they go through customs, and I always enjoyed that. And uh, one of the things that happened, so we were in Chiapas, and a huge storm went through, right? And so Paul and I always used that time to go explore the local villages, wherever that may be. And for example, here we went way up in the hills, seven hours, we got a driver, and we stayed up in these indigenous villages, um, at Mayans, other indigenous um, cultures, nations. We hiked to the uh, border of Guatemala. Who knew that there was like a Grand Canyon in, well, there's two, but uh, this one in the south of Mexico, it's green and it's beautiful and it's up in the mountains and there's huge... Um, vortexes of, of water. We went down the boats. You know, we didn't have any idea that this happened. And that was one of the joys of these trips is be able, to be able to go really see these local um, places and places that would be really hard to get to if you weren't on a boat. Um, next slide. So over the next six months, we, or probably three months, we worked our way up the coast of Mexico. So we went to uh, Mazatlan, Puerto Vallarta. We went all the way up to um, near Topolabomba, and that's the very north side of the Sea of Cortez, to a place called the Copper Canyon. The Copper Canyon is like the Grand Canyon, but five times the size. We went <laughs> rock climbing, uh, Zip lining, you know it, we did it, and it was fantastic. Then we made our way over to the other side of the Sea of Cortez, and it was just beautiful. People call the Sea of Cortez the aquarium, and it really is. There are so many types of wildlife. There are sharks. There's um, every type of fish. It's just beautiful. And so we decided to go way north. I think we had the week off for some reason. And... Um, 
we go to anchor for the first time in the Sea of Cortez, and we look down, and there's this gigantic bean that's spotted that looks like a whale, and turns out it was a whale shark. Well, we had never seen one. Our, captor, our captain had never seen one, and he said, and it's been our dream, and he's like, oh, they're totally fine, which they are, but we didn't know that. We should just jump in. So I stayed on the boat. <laughs> Someone has to stay on the boat, and Paul and, J- Paul and JC jumped in and swam with this whale shark. It was just extraordinary. Another thing, we, uh, we, we hold up like hurricane season in Loreto, and down from Loreto, there's a place called Cabo Pulmo, and I had just gotten my diving license, and we go out for our first dive, and we, is that up here? Oh yeah, this is how we were um, getting on the boat, and so we go out, and the dive instructor says, okay, like, I'll see you down there. It's 30 feet. It's not too deep. So we go off, and I had just gotten my, my certification. So we go down, and all of a sudden, we are surrounded by bull sharks. Now, I didn't really know that we were going to be seeing bull sharks. I didn't even really know what a bull shark was or is. It has a bigger bite and a more dangerous bite than a great white. It's more aggressive than a great white. It is a little bit smaller, or is it bigger? Smaller than a great white, but it's ferocious. Well, the dive instructor said, okay, stay down on the sand, just stay really, really still. And I'm thinking, I hope I know how to do this. <laughs> I've only done this in training. Um, but we sat down there, Paul was about to take my hand off, squeezing it so hard. And we actually sat there with uh, bull sharks circling us for what seemed like a few minutes. Okay. So finally, after a few months, we started our way back up the coast of the U.S. So we went down around the um, the coast of Baja, and once we made that that corner around the bottom of Baja, all of a sudden you're in the Pacific, and it's called the Baja Bash. There's no land. There's nothing to protect you from the winds. The winds are coming at you. You're just like, you're just bashing, right? Four days, uh, 1,500 miles we went. In, in one kind of shot, and uh, we were in the middle of the probably worst storm that we had encountered. There were about 10 to 12 foot waves coming straight at us, so to give you an idea, they were going over the boat. Um, there were 30 knot winds, and I was at the helm. It was nighttime. It was like 2 a.m., and Paul and the captain are sleeping, and we really had to overcome this fear and work as a team. So they're sleeping. All of a sudden, I start to hear or smell diesel. And our philosophy was open, honest, direct. We, all, we never actually got in a fight the whole entire time, none of us, because we all um, trusted each other and we needed to work as a team, much like an entrepreneur. And so JC and Paul came up. Well, it turns out there was a fuel leak in our um, fuel injector lines in the engine room. So diesel was spewing everywhere. This is probably like one of the worst case scenarios you could have. And we were in totally turbulent seas with wind and probably 50 miles, or no, 18 miles, until we could reach any land. Well, that land ended up being a sand spit, not even a city. And just the kindness of strangers and, I mean, all of the people that we met. And so we... um, we take the tender, the dinghy, into shore, and there's some people that are clamming. And I, in Spanish, asked them, I said, hey, do any of you have a tractor? Do you have a John Deere tractor? Because our, our engine is a John Deere engine. And I won't go into all of the details, but someone went and got the fuel injector line. They took it off their engine from their tractor and brought it to us. And a lot of other things happened, but long story short, that fixed it, and we were able to be on our way. Again, the kindness of strangers was just incredible. Then we made it to the U.S., and we went through San Diego. It was beautiful. We made it all the way. We went through Newport Beach, all the way up the coast. We went underneath the um, Golden Gate Bridge on Easter Sunday, actually, 2021. And uh, it, it's just been fabulous. Uh, and this is a picture also of what my setup looked uh, working remotely. So we ended up uh, getting back to Seattle on May 22nd, on my birthday, 2021. And that, uh, 
you know, the year before I was in this, you know, Eco Lodge in Costa Rica. Paul? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so when we started, before we left, I put together, again, rigorous planning. I put together this fantastic list of 36 countries and territories that we were going to visit along the way. Um, we ended up going to seven uh, with COVID and the amount of time that we had. So I think 13% of our initial country list we actually hit along the way. But, you know, the trip ended up being 113% of probably what we expected before we left. Um, so let's go back to these lessons learned and just see, you know, whether or not they apply here to this situation with working remotely. So protect the downside. We hired a captain. We upgraded all of the electronics. We had the medical kits. We protected the downside, and we were able to enjoy the upside of the trip as a result. The value of the job or the career is about the experience, not how much money you make. Heather talked about this from Spain. We, we uh, put this to a test with our uh, jobs while working full time, being able to carve out something and put our minds to do something like this to get experiences above and beyond the jobs that we were doing individually. <clears throat> and three, appropriately, thoughtfully, professionally ask and overcome fear. Heather and I work for companies. We had to ask our manager and our companies if we could go. We did this completely above board and, uh, and finally got them to say yes. And we had to overcome an awful lot of fear for ourselves and huge amount of judgment from family, friends, and especially coworkers. But we went anyway. And live intentionally. Write down a bucket list of what you want to accomplish in life, one, three, five, ten years, write it down on paper, and you will be amazed at what is possible. And keep learning and be coachable. We didn't know anything about boating or about navigation or about mechanical stuff or about weather at all three years ago. This is all kind of new stuff that we were able to add to our toolboxes you know, over the last three years. Um, and our lives are better as a result of it. Um, <clears throat> so last April, Heather finally got around to giving me a Christmas present, and uh, it was ended up being two, two books, like 680 pages of pictures, which were a handful of the amount of pictures that we took over the course of this trip. Um, but it was fantastic uh, recollection of the trip and documentation of it. We are now back in Seattle as of last September. We kind of split our time between land and water, and we're pro hoping to get back to uh, Canada this summer. I would love to get to Alaska. That's probably not going to happen this summer. Um, but we just kind of live one day at a time. I'm hugely grateful for the opportunities to be able to you know, have adventures like this and experiences like this and invest time into doing things like that. Um, and. Uh, and being able to get things uh, above and beyond what we're doing. So we made it, 13,000 miles ultimately, uh, getting back to Seattle, uh, which is probably more than 99% of people who have boats who never leave the marinas, uh, you know, three years later. And, um, and so we just encourage you to take the risk uh, that whatever, whether you're a student here or people are working here or retired, you know, invest time in going after an experience professionally or personally. Literally, the one thing that all of us share is the amount of uh, time and the value of the investment of that time in, in doing what things we want to do and accomplish in life. So I uh, thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak with you tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, have a good evening. And we're happy to answer any questions. Oh, Great. Yeah. Great. Any we questions? questions? Sure. How many hours daily do you devote to working? How did you kind of divide that? How many hours did we spend working and how do we do that? So we worked Seattle hours for our companies. And although we told our bosses uh, that we were on the boat, and I told the people that worked directly for me, 
I didn't tell anybody else. I just had a white background behind us. And, uh, and so I, most people in my company just thought I was at home. And while we're working at the table, I was talking to Mike and Andy about this, we would sit at the table and we would have our arms on the table and try to hold on really tight. We had a huge core workout because you're trying not to move so people don't think you're day drinking and wobbling around during the course of the Zoom calls. So we, although we were above board, we didn't broadcast it. So we worked Seattle hours no matter where we were. And so we were literally on calls from uh, 8 a.m. Seattle time until 5 or 6. And when we had little breaks in time or, you know, Heather would be running by in a bikini to go fish on and go grab a fish, you know, I would still be on a Zoom call. And we just, the split seconds between being at work and having personal time was something like unlike we'd ever experienced before and how quickly we could make that switch. Anything else? So I'll give an example. Um, you know, Paul said, you know, we went after kind of a dream that had never been done before. We were, I didn't actually tell all of my coworkers. And so we almost felt a um, bigger responsibility to come through for our clients and for our companies because we were on a boat. Some people were in much different situations during COVID. But what was amazing is when people saw us living our best life, even us, people couldn't get enough. And I'm not trying to be <laughs> arrogant about it, but we have CEOs, including Accenture, all these different companies following us on our journey. And I think it's because people wait to go after their dreams. And, and we went after it. And people told us we were crazy. Like we said, we didn't know anything about boating. Well, along the way, uh, what we didn't mention was I actually quit my job um, right around Panama. And it was because it was so much work um, being on the boat. And with the Wi-Fi, you lose Wi-Fi. And then both of us are like, oh, my gosh. And then you run into weather and you have to go on. So for me, um, I was doing a lot of the logistics because I speak Spanish. And anyway, as a team, we decided that was the best thing. Well, when we were about in Costa Rica, PricewaterhouseCoopers gets a hold of what I'm doing. They start talking to me. They can't believe the risk that we're taking, the entrepreneurialism of, of what we've thought to do, right? And when we got to Mexico four months later, they offered me my dream job. I had 21 interviews on the boat, okay? I wore the same shirt that wouldn't show the heat or the sweat because it was hot. Um, but I had 21 interviews, and they, this is one of the best, I mean, I manage one of the biggest accounts in the world, right? And I got this while working remotely. And so I think sometimes it's, not sometimes, I really believe when you're doing something you love, the benefits come out of it that you wouldn't even imagine. And the joy that we were feeling while we were working able to do these other things was palpable. And so, you know, I got my dream job while doing this without even really looking for it. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> maybe a bigger boat, maybe live aboard full time. Uh, we kind of go through that uh, habit trail daily. Um, I don't know. I was saying to Mike earlier that I think that this, uh, this is a really unique situation to, <coughs> to, to be able to do this kind of at our age and, and position in life because normally people do this in retirement or they are independently wealthy. We're not in either one of those categories. And so we're kind of left in this murky place of now having to go back to a return to work situation of three days a week in the office in Seattle by May. You're like, mm, 
Is that really what I want? And, uh, and so it causes a little bit of, um, uh, you know, personal introspection. And I'm not sure how it will play out. We'll see. Uh, stay tuned. Four years. Uh, maybe I'll get invited back and can share the, uh, uh, the update. Uh, yeah, could we currently cross the Atlantic? Actually, that's the reason why we got this boat. The, uh, the range from one tank of fuel on this little 43-foot boat is 3,000 miles. So when we went from the Bahamas to Panama, we burned a third of a tank of fuel. And uh, we go seven miles an hour. Uh, so it's slow, but it's a perfect trolling speed for fishing. Um, but this boat, actually a 40-foot version of this boat set the round the world speed record for a production boat of I think 73 days um, and so it's a super seaworthy boat uh, a 46 foot version of this has circumnavigated four different times the chief scientist for Amazon has a, had a 52 foot version of this that he's been working on for 14 years so I went to school on him uh, and how he's been living and working full-time full from his boat as he's circumnavigated. Um, and so it can be done. And if you're going to circumnavigate uh, the world on a power boat, this is probably the, uh, the type of boat to get. So, yeah, it can. We hope to do that someday, soon. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>